Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl Benteen. I'm Janice Siegel. I'm Alan Paul. And I'm Tris Curlis. We're the Manhattan Transfer and you're watching Life Minute TV. I may not always love you. Legendary quartet, the Manhattan Transfer, stopped by the Life Minute Studios recently. The group is celebrating their golden anniversary, 50 years of unforgettable harmonies and amazing performances. It doesn't seem to be that long. It's quite a journey. We've seen a lot of changes in the music business, certainly, yeah. and the world. The 10-time Grammy Award winners just released 50, an album revisiting their biggest hits with new arrangements and timeless favorites from George and Ira Gershwin and the Beach Boys. In addition to the 10-track set, the foursome has also embarked on their final world tour, with stops in the U.S., Europe, the U.K., Japan, and Australasia. This is a Life Minute with a Manhattan Transfer. Well, the album 50 helps celebrate the group's history um, by choosing songs from the catalog and several of them being reimagined with uh, an orchestra, the WDR Funk House Orchestra. We picked uh, uh, 10 songs um, out of many songs. And, and we conceptually we were thinking about, um, well, maybe doing transitions in our career and what represented that, some songs that were uh, uh, hits for us and some songs that we just loved and that we just wanted to redo, reimagine. It's always an interesting way to choose with the four of us what to use, what to, where to go, what music would lend itself to an imaginary land other than just the regular tracks that we uh, we formerly, you know, put them to. And we sang them differently too. Having that uh, atmosphere around us of strings, you know, it was it was quite interesting and, and uh, kind of new for us because the orchestra was in Germany and we were in uh, the San Fernando Valley in LA and together somehow we created this record. It's quite an accomplishment really that it came together. Um, uh, in addition to the, the orchestra being in, in Germany in Cologne, our band, our, the, which was the foundation, right. the rhythm section, were in New York. So it was like putting all of these pieces together in order to have a combined. And then our, our producer, uh, Dave Thomas, and our, our mixer, Tony Shepard, they went over to Cologne, and then they mixed there and came back. It was, it was, yeah. And during the pandemic, by the way. I mean, you know, so we were kind of, obviously we were isolated for a while, you know, in yeah. the studio so all if together. If it wasn't for the internet, uh, we would, probably wouldn't have gotten this done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was the quintessential pandemic project. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because really, the, just the discussion about it came about right at the start of the pandemic. So I think the initial thought would be that we would be together, we would learn things together and just go record. And then we had a lot of time to decide on songs then and arrangers and things. So, yeah, odd, it was oddly perfect mm -hmm. in a crazy world. And it is kind of becoming more common because, you know, you can do that. You can be anywhere in the world and make a record. When it comes to their favorite song to perform, everyone has a different pick. Yeah, I, I, I love to sing Birdland, which we do most every show. Birdland. Because it, you have to pay attention every time. What's yeah. exciting about this show that we're doing in certain markets, certain places, we're working with the big band. And so we're able to do some of that early stuff that we haven't been performing for a while, you know? Um, so that's exciting. Uh, Blue Champagne, for example, which is one of the first songs that we learned, and we haven't done that in, in years. So to be able to actually do that again is really exciting. Purple shadows and blue champagne I think for me when we're traveling, not like a cop-out answer, but honestly, almost every night there's like a different favorite. Or maybe a few nights in a row, I'll, I'll have a favorite kind of right now, a favorite of the moment. Something about a certain song will just be like, oh, I've really been fun, or the band is particularly excited about that tune on this run of shows for whatever reason, or there's a new twist to the arrangement that has brightened everybody up and made us interested in a song, even if we've done it a lot. 
um, you know, and then a month later it catch me and it's a completely different song for the same reason. Um, so that's great though. It's better than better than just being tired of all of them. I don't think ever mm -hmm. you're always. The biggest thing is if I get tired of one, I'm not tired of it anymore when I make a mistake on it because I'm so checked uh, out that I mess up uh, something that's really simple. And then it's like, okay, wake up. You can't just be excited for a few songs. You need to make sure you're focused on all of them. The group has a few pre-show rituals before they take the stage. Janice and I warm up every night, you know, for half an hour with a, with a former voice teacher who is now gone. But we do it every single night the same way, and it just works for these performances, this type of singing. You know, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, memory, uh, what do you call it, sense memory that just yeah. kicks in. So, and because we do basically the same songs a lot, you can get into bad habits. So it's good that we warm up together every night. We have a, a funk party. Yeah, a little dance party. Well, a little <laughs> dance party in our in our dressing room. Yeah. We share a dressing room. Yeah. And, and, and although everybody's invited, I mean, they can come in <laughs> and join us to dance. Usually you know. a lot of Prince playing. Yeah, we do a lot of Prince, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, I do Frankie Valley. And the four seasons. If I want to warm up my my falsetto, my top, then I, maybe I'll sing with, with Frankie or something like that. You know. You know, we we get that kind of question a lot, and what I find interesting is often in the question I hear seeking some special knowledge that we might have that people aren't privy to, and that's just not the case. Really, for everybody. First and foremost, you just have to know yourself. You have to know what your limitations as are. Plato said. As As what you have to do know and thyself. what you can or can't do. Can mm -hmm. I go to a sporting event the day before the show and yell and scream and root for my team and then still be able to do a show? If I know I can't do that, then I don't do that, et cetera. Everyone has to know that or yeah. what kind of diet you need to have. Or, or sleeping. You know, it's all the sleep. basic stuff. Sleep, water, eat sense. well. It's not magic. No. You know, yeah. It's yeah. Not. <laughs> yeah. And always on Taking stage, care. I know for myself, I always have Coca-Cola. <laughs> I never drink Coke outside of performing. I just, uh, the syrup in the Coke helps to keep the, uh, the vocal cords uh, moist. Little secrets. That's right. So when you're going to go out there and you're going to sing, that's right. You can take a little Coca-Cola and, uh, and maybe Coke now will give us, uh, you know, yeah, we'll do a commercial for you, Coke. Not a problem. As for how the Manhattan transfer came to be, they had quite the serendipitous start. So it's, 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 a original it's, it's kind of an unbelievable story, which takes place right here in Manhattan. Um, our founder and friend Tim Hauser was driving a cab in Manhattan. He was a cabbie because he was he had a previous incarnation of the Manhattan Transfer, uh, and they were on, they made one record on Capitol called Jukin with uh, Gene Pistilli. And they w the group broke up because of a divergence of opinion of direction. So Tim was had to go back to being a cabbie, and but he was still always plotting, you know, his musical journey. And it, to make a long story sort of shorter, he actually picked up our original soprano in his cab, Laurel Massé, who was a hot pants wearing waitress, and it was 2 a.m. You know, it's like, can you see the movie? Can you see it now? The, the rain swept the street and she hails a cab and it's Tim. So they start talking. What do you do besides drive a cab? Oh, great. I want to be a singer. Oh, well, I'm doing a project. Can I have your phone number? You know, will you sing on my project? And then I also met him through the cab. Um, a group, I, I was working with my own group and our conga player got in, in his cab. And the same conversation happened. Do you want to come up and meet the group uh, that I'm playing with? Yes, and that's how I met Tim. And then so Laurel and Tim and I found ourselves together and dreaming about reforming the Manhattan Transfer with a different, very focused direction. And we wanted uh, a fourth member. We wanted a man um, uh, because we wanted two men and two women, like the Pied Pipers or, or some of those classic vocal groups. And Laurel was going out with the drummer. Can, in can the I continue the story? Certain <laughs> All right, yeah. So Laurel was dating the drummer that was play, playing in the show Grease. Okay, I was in Grease Perhaps on you've heard of um, <laughs> first show. off Broadway and then moving to Broadway in the, in the original cast. 
um, playing Teen Angel in, in Johnny Casino. Okay. So I'd see Laurel backstage all the time. The guys in the band, after the gig, they would go to a club sometimes and they would, they would jam. So one night I went to see them and Janice and Laurel and this other girl was singing. And I heard them and I thought they were like fantastic. She was 19 at the time and she opens up her mouth and she, did, and she sang Dr. Feelgood, Aretha Franklin's Dr. Feelgood, and totally blew my mind away. So then a couple of weeks after that, I was approached by Laura and said, hey, you know that girl that I was singing with and said, well, she and this other guy, they're forming a group and stuff, and somebody thought maybe you'd be interested or whatever. And so, uh, long story short, I went down there and, and hung out and everything. We talked about the concept and that's how it started. We, we had already been, been doing that in our own way, but I think that we had a very specific uh, concept in terms of what we wanted to do, the type of music that we wanted to do. We definitely wanted to make records. We wanted to take this particular sound and apply it to contemporary record, to, to contemporary music. Um, and that's that was the plan. As for their musical inspirations, they look up to others who've paved the way. Well, all of the incredible vocal groups that came before us, certainly, you know, particular, well, this, particularly the mixed gender groups, there was the Pied Pipers, the Mary Max, the Modern Airs. We loved the High Lows. We loved the Four Freshmen. We loved any group that sang harmony. You know, there was so so many wonderful groups. Yeah. Also, doo-wop groups. You know, I mean, we were. It was very eclectic. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of it. But then, Cheryl comes in. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Uh, 1979, our, our partner Laurel Massé was in a car accident and consequently she left the group. And then uh, Cheryl came in and then that was a whole transition for us in musically in terms of what we were doing and what we wanted to create which was different than what we had done before. And I was a fan immediately. I was a fan from their first album. I was in a swing band up in the Northwest and I said, who are they? these crazy people, young, doing this amazing music, you know, of the 40s and 50s and, you know, a, a pop tune here and there. I went, you know, and the picture on the back of the album, that first album, I said, oh my God, they're so cool. I really, you know, I was really a fan of theirs. So it was a pretty exciting time to audition for them. They've had the chance to collab with some of the most iconic voices of the last century. Tony Bennett. One. Yeah, we sang with Smokey Robinson, James Taylor, Matt Midler, Felix Cavallari, yeah. Phil Collins, mm -hmm. Frankie Valli. We sang uh, at the Grammys with Ella Fitzgerald. Yes, that was pretty. That was pretty. That was uh, kind was of the apex. Color. That was the yeah. peak. Good. Yeah, we sang on a Boz Skaggs record early, early on. So all over the place, kind of, and with a Japanese group called Smap. It was a crazy was record. <laughs> it was a crazy record. And though they've worked with so many artists, they still have a long list of those they'd still love to work with. There's a lot of different styles and types of music, too. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'd love, like, it doesn't seem like it would fit, but I would love doing a tune with Silk Sonic. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> yeah, right? an art, old school R&B yeah. tune. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? I would yeah. love us to do something, actually, with Herbie Hancock. You know, uh, do a whole piano record with mm -hmm. him. That would be right. outrageous because these guys are getting up in years and, you know. Not us, though. Not <laughs> us. <laughs> Not us. The group says they stay young by checking out current and upcoming artists. This is kind of out there, but my newest obsession is this band called Young Gun Silver Fox. Check them out. Very cool. It's like... It's as if a uh, kind of a soft rock band from the late 70s, early 80s made a record and then no, it got lost and then someone just found it. But, so it's brand new, but it sounds yeah. like exactly from that era. And they're amazing. Mm -hmm. I love them. I love them so much. Um, I shared it with our friend Claude McKnight from Take Six, the vocal group. He's also infatuated with them just like me. That's our new favorite thing. That's so cool. I love Moonchild. Cool. I yes. love Moonchild, and I love a singer named Yeba. Mm -hmm. I, on Facebook, I stumbled upon this unbelievable opera singer, Janine Dubois, from Trinidad. Young, amazing, 
the most soulful opera singer with the most amazing instrument I've ever heard. So I'm way into her right now. Nice. You know, I don't go with the alternative. I go with like theater, <laughs> opera, you know, underground, you know. It's mm. So she's remarkable. There's, mark my words. Ed Sheridan. Oh, oh. I really like yes. Ed Sheridan. He's a magnificent musician, yeah. singer, yeah. writer. Love yeah. to do a, a collaboration with him. That would be something. awesome. Shivers. Yes. Yeah. He's yeah. a great editor. Lizzo. Lizzo. <laughs> Billie Eilish. Ooh. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to do something yep. with her. And there's a young, new young singer, Samara Joy, mm -hmm. who is 22 years old, a voice that you think she's an 85 year old <laughs> with that kind of experience, you know, but she's 22. She's, and mark my words, did you just say that? I said it, yeah. <laughs> say it again. Mark my words. Mark her words. Too. Samara uh. Joy. With an incredible career releasing 19 singles, 29 albums, and their music featured in major films and TV shows, how do they keep the momentum going? Well, what keeps us going is caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I think all the different styles that we all resonate with in different areas of music, you know, we like to uh, just do whatever sparks us. It's not necessarily, in fact, it's never just one style, except Vocalese and Brazil. Those were like, you know, thematic. But otherwise, we have such a wide variety of interests musically that I think it, I think it sparks our fans, our audience, because they can all relate to something specific that they love. But, you know, it's just the way we were built. That's just, we, it was nothing that we tried to do. It's just... Well, we never really defined ourselves as one thing or the other. Mm -hmm. We just said we were a harmony group. We're exploring different styles, really mostly of American music, uh, bar, barring the Brazil project, mm -hmm. which we did still d did in a kind of popish yeah, American, American way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think, of course, uh, our fans. The fact that we, all, over all the, the years, mm -hmm are able to tour and, and people come and see us. They want to hear our music, you know, so that's a big part of it too. Since their inception in 72, the Manhattan Transfer endured the changing times and replaced two original members. We lost our partner, Tim Hauser, mm -hmm. you know, back in uh, 2014 and also, uh, you know, Cheryl. Cancer. I had cancer twice and they no. went on without me. I went, no, <laughs> come back. So that kind of put a, a bump in the road for us for a little while, but they waited for me. Yeah, we did. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think, um, you know, we're a family. This is, this is a family, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, he's the newest member. He's part of the family. And so it, it and everybody that, work, uh, that works with us, yes. you know, supports us. You know, our musical director, Jeroen Gershavsky, he's been with us since 1979, mm -hmm. long time. He's like a fifth member in a way, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, our manager, a lot of people, this girl that, that's sitting over here in the corner, you know. Lori Green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Greeny, you know, all, all these people. She's that, tour that manager, but she does everything. She does, she does everything. everything. And, and, it's, and, and so that, that supports us and, and, and helps us to do what we do. You know, all these people, we're so grateful for that. When they're not working, spending time with family and trying to relax are their favorite things to do. I chill. I try to, to balance. I'm sure everybody else does mm -hmm. that as well. We need to have balance, and I think that that's part of how we have been able to continue as long as we have because we've always taken that time to try and balance between you know um, you know being on being this family together and then being able to just kind of chill yeah it's hard home. to slow down you know you get home from a tour and I'm just like this like okay now what do I do now what <laughs> when's the lobby call yeah exactly <laughs> So um, I, I go to antique stores, I, I fix up my house, I just painted my living room before I came here. Just, just stuff, you know, to kind of make my, like Al said, you know, our nest at home as great as we can make it. Because for me, that's what embraces me when I'm not out here. It has to be wonderful, it has to be warm. Yeah, because we have the good fortune to travel to amazing places in the world. Um, 
not exclusively, but that ex a lot of times fills your going out phase of your time. So unfortunately, I know like when I'll, I'll come home from a, a tour, a friend might hit me up. Hey, do you want to go out? And you're just like, like not to be a jerk, but you know, I was just in Italy. So like I just went out in Rome or I just went out in Tokyo. I don't really feel like doing anything, you know, so it's not that I won't or won't, you know, go, go out and see shows and things and try to catch music. But when you're home, it's like, ah, it's great mm -hmm. to just be home. It's yes. kind of like asking a, a taxi driver on his day off to take a ride. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I can't go out and, you know, and people will say, well, yeah, yeah, you, I'm like my daughter. Oh, let's fly to New York. I go, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Go have a good time. I, you know, you just, I don't want to get off, off my couch. Best life advice? Learn to improvise. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Stop and breathe, like on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah. Go within. You know, find, find the, the calmness within yourself, you know, to uh, balance yourself. You know, and go for your dreams. Always go for your dreams. You know. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Try, trying to find, just try to find balance. Try to try to achieve the simple things. If you can get the simple things done, you'll be set. And be okay with not doing anything, because in that nothing space, it's important and it is meaningful, and you are doing something. If that makes any sense. Be the best you can be. Have an idea. Figure out what your thing is and be the, the best version of that thing that, that you can be. And do it until you've somehow sorted out for yourself that you shouldn't anymore. Um, hmm. <laughs> but just don't let someone else sort it out for you. Um, just, just keep on doing what you want to do as long as you possibly can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of like follow your dreams. Yeah. You know, it's, if it's something that lives inside of you, you know, it's something that you really, really want to do, then go for it, you know. And try not to get discouraged because, you know, you're going to be bombarded with a lot of stuff. And a lot of people, a lot of no's, you know, but you, you, you keep going. I mean, it's like with the group, you know, when we first got together, it took us two and a half years to get signed. And we were performing and everything else, and nobody would sign us because we were just too different and everything else. But, you know, we just persevered and trusted, you know, and just keep on going. Yeah. It's yeah. about the journey. Yeah, keep creating and putting your art into the world and someone will find it. In some form, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It'll work that way if it's from the heart. To hear more of this interview, visit our podcast, Life Minute TV, on iTunes and all streaming podcast platforms.